Uh, this is Doug McConnell. Um, I'm the um, uh, executive director and one of the co-founders of A Long Swim. Um, I wanted to thank everybody for um, uh, for dialing in this afternoon uh, or the evening, depending on which time zone you're coming from. Um, and uh, we're trying something a little bit unique this time. Um, in addition to the involvement of A Long Swim, which is a nonprofit, um, we really wanted to highlight the work of um, of Hande Ozdenler, our um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, our scientific director. Um, uh, we were able to um, uh, to attract and convince uh, Dr. Ozdenler to um, uh, to not only uh, uh, be the beneficiary of of of, um, of the money that we raise, but also be the scientific director for a long swim. We couldn't be more pleased with her involvement. Um, we have remarks tonight. Um, uh, we're going to talk about swimming for just a minute, and then we'll talk about the important stuff uh, that uh, that comes out of Hande's lab. Um, but um, uh, just as a just sort of a procedural uh, thing, everybody is going to be muted uh, during the presentations, um, and I'm sure there will be questions that come up as um, uh, as Hande uh, gives some of her remarks and. I would, there are a lot of people going to be online, and if you could um, uh, just put your questions into the chat box, which is in the, um, uh, well, do we want them in the Q&A? I'm sorry, I beg your pardon. If there's a, there's a Q&A box at the lower banner of your screen, that's the place to put, um, uh, to put questions, and we're, we're having a couple of people kind of consolidate those, uh, those questions and answer the, um, answer the ones that can be, can be responded to um, uh, with text straight away. So um, uh, with, with all patience, we appreciate your, uh, your dialing in and, and, um, and so forth. Um, let's first talk a little bit about A Long Swim is a uh, nonprofit. Uh, that was started several years ago after our family was um, was hit pretty hard by ALS. Um, uh, I lost my father to ALS in 2006, um, and one of my sisters uh, just two years ago. Um, the uh, as 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 many of you know, there is a feeling of powerlessness that goes along with that diagnosis that is hard to um, uh, hard to deal with, and 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 we had met. Hande and a number of other uh, ALS researchers and realized very quickly that, um, that we couldn't really help with the science. Their science was, uh, was well along and so forth, um, but it was resources to really, uh, really accelerate that where we could help. And so raising money was something we set out to do. Um, we, we decided to use swimming as a kind of a niche sport to add in with this niche disease um, in large part because um, the swimming was the was the perfect act of defiance uh, against this disease. Just as the as the ALS patient gradually loses their ability to um, uh, to to use their muscles, uh, swimming of course requires that you use them all the time. So that was the uh, that was the connection. We we had the we had the honor really of meeting uh, Hande uh, early on, and um, and we're just so inspired by her. Um, uh, her, her brilliance and, and energy and so forth, much of which will come out during our remarks here and, um, and mostly a dedication to teamwork. Um, we're, we're, the teamwork will be a, a thread of continuity through all of our remarks and, and, um, uh, and Hande is, um, is, is four square behind that. So um, we're now a uh, million dollars deep into, um, into this fundraising process. And um, uh, A Long Swim raises money three or four different ways. Um, uh, one, of course, is just good old-fashioned donations, which are always appreciated. Um, but we, we, um, uh, we have gone about what we call signature swims. Uh, these are long, solo um, uh, swims that are done typically in oceans. Um, distances 15, 20, 30 miles um, all around the world. We'll talk a little bit more about those in a, in a bit. Um, uh, but it, um, I think it underscores the, uh, the commitment to, um, uh, to swimming and, and uh, to using it in a, in a pr productive and creative way. We also, uh, A Long Swim also hosts a series of, uh, of lake swims in the summer. Uh, of course, we're in the Chicago area and, um, and over time, uh, those swims have attracted some 2,000 swimmers. 
We also uh, have sponsored certain athletes, particularly those who have um, a, a real affinity or a passion for ALS, and um, uh, and it's 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 worked out to be a, an extraordinarily successful um, uh, sponsorship program. Um, of this of this what we call signature swims, uh, it includes. Um, uh, seven or eight uh, kind of longer swims. Of course, everybody's heard of the English Channel. Um, we swam the length of Tampa Bay. Uh, there were obviously others on the list. The, uh, the one that's hard to pronounce is the Kaivi Channel. That's in Hawaii, uh, excuse me, and it goes between Molokai and Oahu, um, 32 miles of open ocean. That was quite a, quite a spectacular one. The one at the very bottom is what, one that we're talking about for this summer. Um, it would, I, I'm calling it Northwestern on the list. It really would be Northwestern to Northwestern, starting at uh, the undergrad campus up in Evanston, swimming through Lake Michigan to the medical school downtown. Um, it's about 15 miles. Of course, Lake Michigan can be pretty unpredictable. Um, and uh, there's even talk of trying to do that as an overnight swim. Um, the, um, some of the, uh, just very quickly, a, 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 a photo of the of, uh, of what it looks like uh, in the English Channel as the sun is starting to set. This is one of the most beautiful photos that Susan has ever taken of, um, of an open water swim. And um, it, was a, it was a pretty magical day. Uh, we were seven hours into that swim and, um, uh, and didn't realize we had another seven hours to go in the pitch black. Uh, the next one is a, is a photo of the Kaivi Channel in Hawaii. Of course, it really is paradise there. Uh, the day we swam, it was right on the heels of a uh, of a tropical storm, and so we had some big waves to deal with, and and so forth. But this is what uh, this is what ocean swimming is all about. With respect to the summer uh, uh, series of swims, um, we've um, uh, we've we've hosted swims in in the lakes out in the suburbs of Chicago, also in Lake Michigan. Of course, with COVID um, uh, uh, sort of uh, changing everything for 2020, um, we will be um, offering a virtual swim, not unlike some uh, running clubs are offering virtual runs and so forth, um, uh, so that we can we can uh, maintain good contact, <clears throat> excuse me, with the swimmers that have been active so far, um, and we think will be an opportunity to um, uh, connect with with swimmers who have an affinity for. ALS and, and, um, and the passion for raising money for this disease really nationwide. Um, it's kind of a creative approach and we're very hopeful that, um, uh, that we, can, we can pull that, um, uh, that, that virtual swim together. Another, another lake swim that we're hoping to uh, host is early in August up in Winnetka, um, uh, right on Lake Michigan. I wanna say just a, a word about swimming in the Chicago River because we've been working on a, a hosting an event there for, um, uh, for several years. Um, and what we're trying to do is reintroduce a swim that was done quite literally a hundred years ago, um, uh, right after they reversed the river's flow. And, um, uh, and we think it would be a great sort of a, a novelty event, signature event to be able to have um, uh, swimmers supporting the charity uh, swimming right through the loop. Um, of course, the the next photograph is the is the, uh, uh, the the river as it goes through that loop. And um, uh, I've I've swum in the Chicago River, and it is um, it's a it's a pretty fun experience. Lastly, our sponsored athletes um, uh, are have been a, a, a very interesting program, where um, uh, mostly triathletes um, are are eager to to be part of the team and, and so forth and have been very successful at fundraising. Um, we're working on a, um, an affiliation with the Ironman organization so that we can, um, uh, we can start to work with some additional Ironman distance triathletes. Um, the next photo is, um, is an example of the, of the race kit that we, um, uh, that we provide to our athletes. Um, uh, those in fact are not models, those, are, uh, those handsome lads are my nephews. Um, and um, uh, they, were, they were just on the heels of the Chicago Triathlon a couple of years ago and were good sports about letting us take their photograph. Um, anyway, I'm gonna hand off to Hande in just a minute, but um, uh, suffice it to say that a long swim is gonna be here for the duration. Um, we are never gonna run out of, um, of uh, channels to swim. Um, and I think that as time goes on, we will build the bridge between 
uh, really a niche sport and a niche disease. Um, you know, marathon swimming uh, uh, and, and ALS seem to kind of go together. Um, we will always be committed to teamwork and collaborative, um, uh, to, uh, collaborative research. And, and in that, uh, we think that we have found uh, sort of the perfect fit with Hyundai. Um, and, um, and we're not going to stop until we meet, some, uh, meet an ALS survivor. Uh, there haven't been any so far, and um, and, uh, and and by God, we're not going to quit till we do. So, the cure is out there, and I'd like to introduce my um, uh, my very good friend uh, Hande Ozdenler, who does um, uh, remarkable and inspiring research. Thank you so much, Doug, for the introduction and what you have accomplished with a long swim. And as you say, uh, ALS is indeed a long swim. And um, it is an, an it is a it requires energy, and it doesn't the solution and the cure is not um, it, uh, it doesn't happen overnight, and we all have to work as a team. And uh, today, I would like to um, share with you um, some of my uh, ideas about uh, you know how COVID is affecting science and research and what we must do um, to overcome these time, you know, these tough times and even turn them into a benefit. So uh, for today's webinar, I actually, oh, okay. So the outline is um, that I will be talking a little bit about COVID-19 and why this pandemic could actually serve as an opportunity for research especially, and what is our current research efforts and how we must move forward. And of course, the theme is the collaboration, 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 and the importance of teamwork. So I think many of us have not had any pandemic to this extent. This is the first time I'm going through this pandemic in my, in my life, and um, it's, a bit sad, it's a bit frightening, and, uh, and I think this affects patients even more. And that's why I thought it was important that we have this webinar and we share some of our concerns and give some information about the COVID. So as you know, this is actually a virus, it's not a bacteria. So the viruses, um, the mechanism of virus replication and the bacteria giving harm to the cell is a bit different. different. So the virus gets into the cell and hijacks the um, mechanism of replication and protein production of the cell, uses the cell to make its own replicates and bursts the cell, kills the cell, and now we have more virus. With bacteria though, you know, you can have um, antibodies, you can kill the bacteria, but with virus, you can't really kill the virus because by definition, virus is not alive. So the only way to get rid of the virus is not to make yourself available to the virus so that the virus cannot use you as a host. And this virus is very unique because of its um, structure, also its uh, DNA, and it is not lab-made, it is not made by anyone. This is actually a biological virus, and it is very different from the flu. So we hear people saying, you know, this is another form of flu. It actually is not, or it is more dangerous because of the, our own number, which means uh, the possibility of people infecting other people is very high with COVID-19. This virus has very high tendency to go from one person to another. And the incubation time is very long. And the problem is people who don't have a, a, a phenotype can also be shedding the virus. So even though you look healthy, you may be uh, transmitting the virus to another person. And the hospitalization rate is very high and uh, the death rate is also very high. So this, this is one of the uh, worst viruses that could uh, lead to a huge pandemic, and I, actually it, 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 ha it has uh, led to that. And I think the only way um, to overcome this, as stated by the officials, is by staying home, by breaking the chain, and by not making yourself available to the virus so that the virus cannot use your body to uh, replicate itself. And I was surprised to um, witness that this whole thing turned into a global effort. It's not just one country, the whole world has come together 
to end this pandemic. To me, this is very powerful. So I, it was actually a, a wake up call almost because then I said, wow, so this can be done. So I think what we have learned from this experience um, is very valuable and we need to find a way to adapt it to uh, our own research. Because I think there is not a single person who isn't affected by the pandemic. And we understand that the patients are affected even more. And you know, they need to see their doctor, they need to be in the clinic, you know, they're, they, people must come to their homes to help them. They need help, they need care, and many things are not uh, possible right now because there are major closures and uh, there's a massive pressure on healthcare system. But what do we learn from this? And what must we do as we move forward for a world uh, post-COVID? So I think that we learned that the virus does not discriminate among people. So for, for virus, it doesn't matter which nationality you are, if you're tall, if you're short, if you have curly hair, if you are this, whatever. If you are a person, you are a target. And if you think about it, if you are a person, there's a very good chance that you may have ALS, HSP, PLS. These multineuron diseases also do not discriminate among people. If we are human beings, you know, there is a good chance that we may have a multineuron disease. And now I think the whole world realized that being locked down in our homes is very frustrating. So we don't like that. But if you think about it, some ALS patients and even HSP, PLS patients could be locked down for years. And I think this is a very unique opportunity for the whole world to develop an appreciation for what the ALS patients and HSP PLS patients are going through. And that um, appreciation could actually be very um, pivotal for our next steps. And if there can be a global effort to that uh, degree, why not develop a global effort to end motor neuron diseases next? So this can be done. So then it is up to us to actually uh, develop better teams and raise our voices in a more effective way that after COVID is over, maybe the next would be the motor neuron diseases and that could be possible. So how does COVID affect research, right? That's a major question. But to answer that, let me break it down into phases of research. So the research is done in, uh, in different phases, right? The first phase is the design phase. And that phase actually is the most um, time consuming or the step that takes the longest time because you have to observe, you have to question, read, learn, think, build your hypothesis, design the best experiment, establish collaborations, build the team. So this design could take for years. And then the execution is doing the experiment. Then analysis of data, so you analyze data. Then you synthesize your data, which means you make sense of the data, put it within the context of previous findings, and you make sense of it. Then you share your findings, which means you write reports, manuscripts, invention disclosures, grant applications, patent applications. So if you look in this line, the only thing that uh, you cannot do at home is the execution part. You can definitely design your experiments at home. And if you have the tools, if you have the um, softwares, you can analyze your data on your computer at home. You can uh, synthesize your data, make sense of it at home. You can share your data at home. The only part is the execution part. And that part um, would be affected if you cannot go to the lab. But the, last, the rest of the research would actually be uh, still ongoing. And this actually, if you think about it, it may not be a problem, but it can also be an opportunity. It all depends how you look at it. Because as John Adam said, every problem is an opportunity in disguise. And you, know, you may choose to take this as a problem, but you may choose to take this as an opportunity and ride on it. Because I think this gives us, this, this COVID moment gives us a Zen moment. Because if we want to move fast, we have to go slow. And sometimes we have to stop to understand, to appreciate, and um, even to sharpen our uh, axe and knives. So this is the 
best time to plan better and to build better teams and invest in the time of the design and the analysis and other parts. So I think that there is a very good opportunity for us to turn this corona pandemic into one-time opportunity in science. And that is by focusing our, our attention to what is important and what is the overall goal and how can we build teams and better and stronger teams and how can we plan better and before we execute as a team. Because once we plan better, the moment we can we begin to execute, we will be faster, we will be more effective. And that's why I'm happy to have this uh, webinar with you, because I'm going to tell you what we have accomplished so far, what is our plan as moving forward, and I would love to form teams with you so that we actually move together faster and better. So then, what is the overall goal, really? And I think for the motor neuron biology field, for patients out there, for ALS, HSP, PLS patients, even for patients who suffer from spinal cord injury, I think the goal is to develop effective and long-term solutions to motor neuron diseases. And we have to remember that the patients develop these diseases because their motor neurons undergo progressive degeneration. And we need to understand why that happens and if we can find a solution for that. So how do we get there? And I think there are four major steps. One of them is that we need to understand the underlying causes of neurodegeneration. Why do we have neurodegeneration? And the second is we have to reveal why each patient developed the disease. Because this is a very complex disease. Motor neuron diseases are very complex. Even though patients may display um, similar outcomes, the underlying cause for their pathology may be different, and we need to understand how that occurs. And the third, we have to improve the drug discovery efforts. Then maybe we can develop some personalized medicine approaches and give the cells, the dying neurons, what they need at a very cell-based and directed way. And of course, we have to build teams, team up with people, associations, foundations, centers, Whoever has the same goal and works towards the same goal, we have to get together. So the first one was understanding the underlying causes of neurodegeneration. As you can see in this uh, photograph, it's pretty complex. <coughs> because the motor neurons do not work in isolation. Um, there are cells that help them, like astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, and, uh, and also uh, um, even some, um, even microglia. And if you look inside the cells, there may be problems with their um, nuclear membrane, protein aggregation, mitochondrial problems, axon transport defects, um, and interactions with motor neurons and astrocytes, DNA repair mechanisms, vesicle transport defects, excitotoxicity, there are numerous mechanisms that can go wrong uh, in patients. And now, if you look carefully in the boxes, there are some protein names, and these are actually genes that are mutated in some patients. So it is possible that patients who have mutations in those genes, we begin to understand what is the cellular uh, defect um, based on the mutation that they have and based on the protein that is uh, not functioning in those patients. And here's another picture from Don, one of Don Cleveland's uh, reviews that axon transport defect, <coughs> mitochondrial dysfunction, even the vasculature, which means the tight junctions, the uh, connections with the uh, blood stream, ER stress, uh, proteosome inhibition, protein um, misfolding defects, um, the oxidative stress, free radicals, these are all potential problems. As you can see, there are many. And not all patients have uh, them to the same extent, to the same degree, but these are potential causes of degeneration. Now I'm gonna make the story even more complex and I'm gonna tell you that this is not just one neuron, the, the whole circuitry degenerates because the movement actually starts in the brain, 
uh, with the order going from brain to the spinal cord. So there is a brain component, there is a spinal cord component. The brain component, we call them the corticospinal motor neurons, the upper motor neurons, the bed cells, and they project to the spinal cord targets and they um, make connections with the spinal motor neurons, which in turn um, move into the uh, muscle and they um, enable muscle contraction. But the order goes from the brain. And in diseases such as hereditary spastic paraplegia, primary lateral sclerosis, it's mainly the upper motor neurons that die. And in ALS, it's basically these two neuron populations, brain and spinal cord motor neurons, they progressively degenerate. And the upper motor neurons are very important, especially for movement, because the, um, the order of movement the, uh, initiates in the brain. And these neurons, and look how elaborate they have, they have a very long apical dendrite and they have an axon that goes all the way to the spinal cord targets. These neurons are very unique in their ability to collect, integrate, translate, and transmit cerebral cortex input towards spinal cord targets. And look at the axon. It's a very long axon. As you can imagine, the transport in that axon is very pivotal. And if there are any problems, like mutations in the KIF, uh, KIF1A uh, genes, the uh, axon transport machinery is broken. And that's one of the reasons why the upper motor neurons begin to degenerate. And it's not only our lab, there are multiple and many numerous labs all around the world uh, saying and repeating and uh, conveying the importance of corticospinal motor neurons and the upper motor neurons, and even to a degree that their dysfunction could be a diagnostic marker because the cortical dysfunction occurs very early in ALS. And we find that there are apical dendrite degeneration in bed cells in ALS and the cortical dysfunction potential driver of ALS. And again, more findings and even a therapeutic finding that if you correct the SOD1 mutation in the cortex, you improve the motor neuron circuitry, you improve the health of the spinal motor neurons and the neuromuscular junction, suggesting that if we make the brain happy, we can actually improve the whole motor neuron circuitry. And it's very unfortunate that the brain has been uh, kept out of the equation, but I think there will be no effective or long-term solution if we cannot make the brain happy because the movement starts in the brain and the motor neuron circuitry degenerates in patients. And if we cannot keep the brain happy, we cannot sustain um, the motor neuron circuitry and that's what degenerates in patients. So how do we understand why they die? It's very hard because the brain is complex, it's very heterogeneous. And we were actually the first group to make a reporter line for the upper motor neurons, for the corticospinal motor neurons, and we published this in 2015. And this was the, one of the um, first lines where the corticospinal motor neurons or upper motor neurons were labeled with fluorescence. And it wasn't all neurons in the brain. It was mainly the corticospinal motor neurons. And the fluorescence was there uh, from date, date of birth to, till two years of age. And um, you know, we, th this was considered one of the breakthroughs. And uh, we received the. Um, one of the best 10 innovations for the year award by the International Innovation uh, Journal. So after we can make these neurons vis you know, um, visually available and that we can study them, of course we cross them with different disease models that display uh, upper motor neuron degeneration. And of course the question arises if the mice is a good model for human because we know that there are many uh, clinical trials that failed. But if you look at the species level, yes, it is very different. If you look at the tissue level, yes, it is very different. But if you look at the cellular level, they are almost identical. They are very identical. This is almost as close as you get as a cellular level. How about pathology? So if you look at the uh, mouse upper motor neuron and then the human upper motor neuron, we actually see time after time again that the underlying causes of pathology is exactly the same. For example, there, there's apical dendrite degeneration in the mouse, there's apical dendrite degeneration in human. Look at this, this is sporadic ALS, this is familial ALS, these are the apical dendrites of bed cells. This is in the normal control, and in the patients, they are all degraded, degenerated, 
And if your apical dendrite is like this in the upper motor neuron, they cannot receive input from the brain. And if they cannot receive input from the brain, they cannot carry the um, message to the spinal cord. So that's a major problem. And this is observed in, a, uh, in many different mouse models. Nuclear membrane defects, nuclear membrane defects. Mitochondrial defects, mitochondrial defects. ER defects, ER defects. So translation at the cellular level is, uh, is happening. And uh, if we actually focus our attention, you know, shift our focus from mice to neurons, our findings will be translational. And I think this is very important. Then we begin to understand uh, different mechanisms. For example, there are numerous mouse models generated based on the mutations that are detected in uh, human ALS or HSP or PLS patients. One of them is the profilin. So we collaborated with Mahmoud uh, Kiai, and he made actually the reporter line, uh, he made the profilin, um, transgenic profilin mice, and we also made them report um, GFP now, and we find apical dendrite defects in them. Uh, Mukesh studied the Alcin uh, mice, which lacks Alcin uh, function. And Alcin is a gene for um, the patients with mainly with upper motor neuron diseases. And uh, together with um, Marco Martina, <coughs> we found that after we make them fluorescent by crossing them to our reporter line, look in the brain, now they become GFP. Because these are GFP, we can look inside their neurons and begin to investigate what goes wrong using immuno coupled with EM. And here's a cell and a cartoon drawing. Here's the nucleus. This is the endoplasmic reticulum where the protein is made. This is mitochondria where it may, uh, usually the ATP, the energy is produced. And here is the Golgi. And this is where the proteins are, um, um, glycosylated or sugar uh, is added to them so that the proteins become active and then they're also secreted to where they should be secreted. And these are the EM images of Golgi. Look at this in the normal, here you have see the stacks and also in others, but look at the upper motor neurons that lack alcin function. You can see there is a major, major problem with their Golgi. And <coughs> if you look at the <coughs> cell, and look at their apical dendrites, it is degrading. It is degenerating. And that's very specific to the upper motor neurons or the corticospinal motor neurons because cells just <coughs> next, next, now nearby do not show the same pathology. And if you look at the mitochondria, here's the normal one. And the other cortical neurons in the Alcin knockout mice also look normal. But if you look at the upper motor neurons, you can see the mitochondria is, they have broken, they accumulate together and they form these blobs. And after a while, they must be cleared away. So they don't have mitochondria. And by looking inside the cells, so we begin to understand what may be going wrong in them, that the mitochondrial defects, problems with Golgi, cytoarchitectural problems. So we begin to understand why upper motor neurons die in patients, for example, with Alcin mutations or lack Alcin function. So similarly, we have done, um, uh, we have done similar studies with the um, TDP mice, mouse model, which have TDP pathology. And uh, previously, the nuclear membrane defects were shown. And here, this is the nuclear membrane. You can see that there is an accumulation inside the nucleus. Look at this, they, they cannot go out from the nucleus to the cytoplasm. And of course, we made the reporter line because we have the mouse that has um, ALS-like phenotype and there is progressive degeneration of upper motor neurons. We cross down with our uh, reporter line and you can see that with time, the upper motor neurons degenerate. So now let's look inside the upper motor neurons and begin to understand why they degenerate. And again, there are mitochondrial problems Look at the mitochondria, they're all diseased, but in the wild type, they're pretty healthy. And this is the apical dendrite. They have very long apical uh, mitochondria in the apical dendrites. So there, there are massive problems with their mitochondria. And if you look at the human, um, human brain, especially the bed cells, look at the mitochondrial problems. It is very similar to what we have seen 
in the upper motor neurons in the reporter line. This is a mitochondria and inside is hollow, which means they cannot produce ATP. There will be a major problem with their ATP production. And in the, again, in this upper motor neurons of a uh, mouse, this is a normal ER. And look at this, with disease, they're all broken apart. And sometimes you have enlargement of the lumen, but they're broken apart. And in the human, this is normal. It's almost like textbook, but these are all diseased. So there is also a problem with their ER. So which means that there, there could be an ER stress. There is a problem with their uh, protein and with their mitochondria. And here was a, um, a cartoon you know, summarizing the problems that the upper motor neurons have when there's a TDP pathology. There are nuclear, em nuclear envelope defect defects, enlarged and deformed ER, mitochondrial defects, and also uh, large autophagosomes. So I think focusing our attention to neurons at a cellular level yields translational information. So we really have to uh, develop ways to understand why these neurons are more vulnerable than others and what are the mechanisms of degeneration. This was at a cellular level, but what happens at a molecular level, which means at a genetic level or at a protein level? So now that the upper motor neurons are GFP, which means fluorescent, we can purify them as a pure neuron population at different stages of their disease progression from many different mouse models. And each mouse represents um, a different underlying cause. So we would imagine that the upper motor neurons in this mouse versus the upper motor neurons in this mouse may have different cellular uh, pathologies because they become diseased, but they become diseased due to different uh, causes. So we isolate RNA and we look at gene expression. Then we isolate cells and we do proteomics. And this is a massive, massive undertaking for the past five years. And we collaborate with proteomics, uh, Dr. Keller, and with our international collaborations and proteomics center, Dr. Young. And now we begin to reveal the proteins that are present at different stages of the disease. And interestingly, some of those proteins are secreted proteins. And as you can imagine, the secreted proteins could give an important information about potential biomarkers. So now looking at the changes in the blood and uh, the serum and plasma samples of ALS patients over time, especially ALS patients with prominent upper motor neuron involvement or HSP and PLS patients, we begin to identify some proteins that show an increase over time. So this is very important because they may be the proteins that tell us about the timing and extent of upper motor neuron degeneration in patients. And because this information was lacking, it was very hard to develop clinical trials because we need a quantitative measure to see if our uh, treatment is effective and if we get a readout. And this, th those proteins could be uh, giving us a readout. So that's why we have to focus more on this uh, particular topic. So how do we get there? The second is to reveal how each patient developed the disease differently. So I've told you that we begin to understand the underlying cause of neurodegeneration at a cellular level, at a molecular level, at a protein level, different disease models, different time points. But then how do we match this to different patients? Because patients also develop the disease differently. And I'm not going to go so much into detail because this is a published work. And I suggest and I ask, please read this paper. This paper is a... Um, distilled um, output of five years worth of work, and we have 42 supplemental figures. And if you publish each page of that uh, paper, it's like 300 pages. We have taken every gene that is uh, considered as causative and mutated or associated um, or disease modifier. And we found the protein binding partners of all these genes and begin to investigate their interaction uh, domains, upstream regulators, protein-protein interaction uh, levels. And this was actually covered as a news. Um, you can read this art article as well. By doing so, we begin to reveal 
the canonical pathways that are affected in different disease, in different patients. And here you will see different um, genes, pathways, and also um, signaling um, events. So based on the mutations that they have, the mutations that patients have, we begin to understand which cellular event, event is mostly affected. So lipid homeostasis was one, protein homeostasis was another one, and maintaining of site architectural dynamic was another one. There are four more in the paper, so I'm not gonna go into detail, but um, there are numerous studies that begin to reveal why each patient developed the disease differently. And we can learn from their mutations, we can le learn from protein interaction domains, we can learn from their canonical pathways, and also from the uh, blood that they, uh, from their uh, blood, urine, and the protein changes in those um, biofluids. So the third point, how do we get there? We can actually improve the drug discovery efforts. If I tell you that even today, there are no preclinical assays that incorporate the health of upper motor neurons before they move into clinical trial. Maybe you won't believe me, but it is true. So there are so many compounds on clinical trials right now, but none of them has ever considered whether this compound improves the health of the upper motor neurons. And I think this is a major, major, um, um, you know, a problem in the field because we really have to ask if those compounds also improve the health of the upper motor neurons, especially for diseases that are characterized by the upper motor neuron loss. So, you know, they would say there are no uh, reporter lines or there were no essay systems and brain is complex and so forth. But now we actually made the upper motor neurons fluorescent and we developed the uh, drug uh, discovery platform together with Silverman to move the uh, clinical trials forward and to give them better ideas about which compounds may also improve the health of the upper motor neurons. Because the corticospinal motor neurons are GFP, they retain their GFP expression in vitro, allowing for an in vitro uh, drug uh, screening or uh, ver verification platform where we can um, monitor if those um, upper motor neurons like the compound or not. We can also have in vivo trials, there the compounds may be given by different uh, routes uh, to the um, mouse models, and we can see whether um, the corticospinal motor neurons are retained in the cortex and their degeneration is halted or stops. So we were actually given an NIA uh, grant uh, to investigate more of the uh, drug discovery for upper motor neurons and developing a platform which actually asks the question of uh, do upper motor neurons like the compound treatment or not. And I think this is very important, especially for uh, ALS patients, PLS patients, HSP patients, and that's how we can improve the clinical trials in the future. Because the drugs can be based on mechanism, because if we understand uh, which mechanism or which motor neuron improves upon compound treatment, and we know which mechanism is affected in those upper motor neurons, we can even develop clinical trials such that we target patients based on the mechanisms that are affected. And this would be a, a, a way forward, and I think the success rate of clinical trials would improve. So the fourth is to develop a cell-based directed therapy and potentially a personalized medicine because most of the motor neurons, it's considered a rare disease. And it, as you can imagine, it is very hard for drug companies to be interested in rare diseases because the number of patients are not as high as they expect or they wish to have or you know, for their own drug uh, discovery um, um, efforts. But this is a bit unfair because even though the diseases or the patients could be rare, there has to be a way that we treat them. And this could be possible by uh, developing a personalized medicine approach. And to be able to do this, we've been developing an viral uh, injection 
into the motor cortex. And this is AAV, it's not COVID. <laughs> this is AAV, it's FDA approved. And it is possible to use um, AA, uh, adeno associated viruses to um, perform gene delivery directly to the motor cortex and very specifically to upper motor neurons. So we've been working on this for the past six years and we started with first with Marta Bone and continued with Devries and now we're working with Dr. Hatsopoulos at the University of Chicago and uh, investigating in macaque mac monkeys to see even more translational efforts uh, in the future. And we actually developed uh, a strategy where direct cortex injection by different viruses, different serotypes, when one, two, five, six, seven, eight, nine, you know, we tested them all and we found AAB22 was the best. And even so, that we could get about 70% of transduction efficiency to the corticospinal motor neurons. And that was very high because if you consider the upper motor neurons are about 1% and just by one time injection, 70% of all the neurons that are transduced are, are upper motor neurons, that's pretty high. And the other 20% are colossal projection neurons, which is also good because they are the second wave neurons that they generate. Now we actually improve this and we have better percentages. And I think in the future, it will be possible to know the mutation in the patient, develop, develop a therapy just for that patient, develop the virus and inject into their cortex, correct the mutation in, on the neurons that de they need the ter therapy without affecting other neurons or cells in the brain, and that will be a personalized medicine. So this is another avenue that can be um, developed in the very near future. So if I summarize, I think we begin to understand why upper motor neurons degenerate. And that's very important because we use pure cells, we look uh, electron microscopy right into the cell, we uh, do purification, RNA isolation, gene expression, protein. It's very precise, different time points, different models, and we begin to understand why they degenerate. And that's very important because that sets the stage for all the discoveries to follow. And by doing so, we begin to identify potential biomarkers. And that's also very interesting because we use uh, cells and cell, uh, trans the cells are very translational. The information that we obtain from those cells leads to proteins that are also present in the humans. And we are very happy with our findings. Then we begin to understand the cellular events that are perturbed in patients. And we're developing a novel drug discovery platform used, utilizing diseased upper motor neuron um, response and also the AV mediated gene delivery for future therapeutic applications and future personalized medicine applications. So we are generating knowledge and we are developing, uh, developing platforms and we are developing ways to uh, treat the upper motor neurons. But of course, this is just the beginning because as we move forward, I think it is very important that we create an environment and culture where collaborative effort is encouraged and enhanced because complex problems require team effort. It is not just one person who can solve everything or do everything. I think we have to build teams among scientists so that their ideas will find a platform to nourish. And we have to focus on big questions and the overall goal. But there are some uh, goals that we can actually attain within the uh, coming years. And for example, we can I definitely identify biomarkers that will inform us on the timing and extent of upper motor neuron loss in patients. We can identify biomarkers that will help us distinguish patients based on the underlying causes of their vulnerability. We can help improve the success rate of clinical trials by directly learning from diseased neurons. And we can deliver solutions directly to the neurons in need using, using gene delivery approaches. These are not theories. These are not just wishful thinking. This is the, all these uh, goals are attainable only if we work together, come together and form teams because the knowledge is there. The therapy, the therapeutic applications are there. And once we have the knowledge, it's very easy to build on that knowledge. And I think we're getting there. So that's another reason that I wanted to uh, join a long swim and, um, you know, took the offer of, um, being their scientific, um, the director of science, because a long swim 
is ALS. ALS is a long swim. And a long swim also requires team efforts. Even though there is one person in the water, there's a huge team behind that one person looking at the water, weather, you know, uh, feeding, resting, and it's planning the whole year. And it is a team effort. And I think it is time and COVID pandemic allows us to have that Zen moment and to form the team, uh, teams with, among scientists, patients, pharmaceuticals, philanthropists, clinicians, patient-led nonprofit organizations, and even press members, because we have to have our voice out. We need to be heard. And if you are a scientist working on uh, cellular mechanisms of neurodegeneration, working on what motor neuron biology, please uh, let's get in touch. If you are patient, please let's get in touch. If you are a drug, working in a drug company, please let's get in touch. I would like to test your compounds to see if they also improve the health of the upper motor neurons. The philanthropists, please support and uh, help us reach out to more scientists and do better science. Clinicians, I think clinicians are already uh, teaming up and there are very good um, clinical centers and there is a very good group uh, forming um, clinical trials. And I am very happy to be part of um, the NEILS in that respect and we meet and um, they have already had meetings and discussing with patients how the COVID affected ALS and actually they gave me the idea to do this so I thank them. And the patient-led nonprofits, I think they are the energy and uh, behind the movement and they say enough is enough and I agree with them. So to develop effective and long-term solutions for ALS, HSP and PLS and other diseases that affect motor neurons, please let's, to get, let's get together and let's form the team. And I would like to thank all my collaborators all around the globe. I have numerous, hundreds of collaborators almost in every country and I am very thankful to them. The world is our um, playground and the world uh, is our home. And COVID also made us realize that our nationalities, our borders does not matter. Humanity brings us together and the world is our home. And science also brings us together and science makes sure that all scientists are actually um, bounded, bounded together with their knowledge of science and with their will to make a difference in the lives of patients. And I want to thank all my lab members. I am blessed to uh, have one of the best team and we've been working very hard, even though uh, there is COVID pandemic, our lab is open and functioning, thanks to all my lab members. And uh, when there were about uh, five cases in Chicago, we had a meeting and we planned ahead, we ordered, we made a plan, and um, now every research is ongoing. And thanks to all the hard work of all my lab members, and I'm indebted to them, um, I'm very thankful to have my lab members. And of course, I've been very, very lucky uh, to receive very strong and good uh, funding from both NIH and from our university, from many foundations, Vansky Foundation, Brain Research Foundation, Let's Turn ALS Foundation, ALS Association, and now a long swim. So I thank you very much for all your time and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, and let's form the team, and let's move together. Thank you so much. Ande, that was terrific. Uh, we uh, so appreciate uh, so appreciate your uh, your remarks and and so forth. <clears throat> what I'd like to do is consolidate a couple of the questions that have come in <clears throat> and hear your comments on them. I'm also going to keep an eye on the clock. It's five minutes of seven Central Time. Um, and I understand that some people may have to drop off. Uh, we probably will go over our, our, um, our original hour uh, timeline, but um, if you can stay with us, we'd be very grateful. Um, the um, uh, talk for a minute about on the, on the personalized medicine, I think that was a, a question or a theme that, uh, that, that intrigued a couple of people. Um, the, um, uh, what we're hearing is that um, the, as the biomarkers are reveal more and more of the um, of the of the challenges with these upper motor neurons, uh, that arguably we can 
uh, actually get to a point where the, the, the drugs are customized for those mechanisms, essentially making a personalized um, uh, treatment? So I don't think that we can design uh, compounds per patient. So it's, you know, uh, that would be very hard because uh, the compounds need to go through toxicity studies and numerous studies before they can even be um, considered for patients. But uh, gene therapy approaches um, may actually be uh, developed, in my opinion, so that, for example, if we know the mutation in the patient, there are ways either to reduce that mutation or to replace the mutated gene with a wild-type gene or knock down the mutated gene. Because even if you don't have some genes or some proteins, it's okay. For example, even if you don't have the SOD1 uh, protein, you know, it's not toxic, you can still live. But when you have the mutation, then it becomes toxic. So, you know, knocking the gene down may be a solution. Reducing its expression levels may be a solution. Actually, this was the solution for the spinal muscular atrophy, like with antisense oligonucleotides, that you can uh, manipulate the level of gene expression that thus the levels of protein. And if we can find out uh, what is the cause of neural degeneration at a genetic level, at a protein level, at a canonical pathway level, at a systems level, then we uh, may define better targets. And if we can use, let's say, adeno-associated viruses for directed gene delivery, that would be very, very uh, powerful. And I think there are many other groups around the world uh, investigating this, because for personalized medicine, uh, I think this is the way for the future, um, the whole uh, expression vector or the cassette may be uh, designed for the patient if we know where the mutation is and how to um, manipulate um, that mutation. The tools are developing and I'm very optimistic about that for the future. That's pretty exciting stuff. Um, I remember years ago, you were one of the first um, uh, ALS uh, centers around the world to really start to focus on upper motor neurons. Um, and now it's become really one of the main uh, sort of tracks of, of, um, of ALS research. Talk for a minute about how um, uh, that, that um, uh, well, first you overcame a, a, a fair amount of criticism if my, re my recollection is correct, and then how it's really been more embraced by the scientific community. Yes, um, so when I was a postdoc in Jeff Macklis's lab and working with uh, Dr. Brown also at uh, Mass General Hospital nurse, nurse Surgery Department, uh, at the time, you know, we were focusing on the upper motor neurons, the corticospinal motor neurons, but of course the field was telling us that the brain is very complex and it degenerates anyway, and its degeneration is secondary to the ongoing spinal motor neuron degeneration. So even if you help the upper motor neuron, it's not really um, therapeutic because they're gonna degenerate anyways. It was a byproduct of an ongoing degeneration. But we realized early in the beginning that the cortical cells are very important and they actually raise a red flag very early in the disease because there is a spine loss, there's hyperexcitation, and uh, Dr. Wukik's group in Australia also uh, confirmed these findings uh, with studies in their patients. And we were looking at a very uh, detailed cellular level analysis. And we were showing that there's apical dendrite degeneration, there's spine loss, and there's mitochondrial dysfunction. And it, now, for example, uh, Mukesh Gautam, who's also an, a long swim fellow, he found that the mitochondria become diseased so early, like the the pups are almost with their mothers. You know, their eyes are still closed and they have mitochondrial defects at a cellular level. So, you know, the vulnerability uh, is defined in many different ways. If you look at the cell and if you look at inside the cell and the organelles, ultrastructural level, the degeneration happens much, 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 much earlier. So also our colleagues around the world like uh, Clive Svensson, for example, in the United States, he showed, his group showed that uh, if you improve the health of the upper motor neurons, the spinal motor neurons improve, the neuromuscular junction improve, so that the cortex could actually be a very feasible target. And I, be I believe that because the movement starts in the brain and brain has a huge input to the spinal motor neurons. 
And if we make the motor neurons in the brain happy, the spinal motor neurons will also be happy. And you know, it, was, it took me a while to, you know, to convince the neuroscientists that the brain is important. <laughs> But finally, I think we all agree that the brain is important and um, we would like to make the drug companies also realize that the brain is important and there are avenues now to uh, investigate the health of the upper motor neurons. I think if our goal is to cure the upper motor neurons in the patient, we have to ask whether our compound improves the health of the upper motor neurons, right? So we can't just do it essays with cells that are not related to upper motor neurons. So I understand that was not uh, feasible before, but now it is feasible. And I think uh, they should take advantage of this so that um, they will make better uh, educated guesses as they move forward. Because each time they move forward for the clinical trial, it's millions of dollars of investment. I mean, before you make that investment, wouldn't you want to know more about your compound's ability to improve upper motor neuron health? I mean, if I was a drug company, I would like to know. Well, and um, how how fortunate we are, we all are, that you were um, not only uh, sort of observant of that, but also brave enough to to um, uh, kind of go against the grain a little bit with the uh, the, the medical researchers to uh, to pursue it. Um, let me switch gears just a little bit. I know there's a there are a number of questions about what patients are doing now and. Um, uh, both in the environment of COVID and and whether there are uh, ongoing trials and and so forth. Obviously, you and Dr. Silverman have had um, uh, a, a good fortune in in uh, terms of getting drug discovery grants. Um, but but to what extent will the will the COVID uh, discovery and and behavior um, uh, have an impact on on both the progress with drugs and patients who are, are kind of waiting for some of those outcomes? You know, of course, we have to admit that um, this is very unfortunate uh, because, uh, you know, patients going into clinic uh, may not be possible because of the COVID um, um, issue because, you know, we don't want our patients to have the COVID because they're already dealing with ALS and what motor neuron diseases. It would be the last thing that we want to have them COVID as well. But I think uh, something extraordinary is happening right now, and we have to adapt to it. And that is telemedicine, the power of telemedicine. Because especially for motor neuron disease patients, it's been always a struggle for them to go from their homes to the clinic, right? Because it's very hard to move, and yet you have to travel miles and miles, hours and hours to be able to see a doctor. And now with telemedicine, the doctor can be right in your room and you can meet with multiple doctors all at the same time. And there are also equipments that you can take home. For example, you know, you do this, yes, you do in the clinic and you do this, but there are uh, equipments now uh, developed that you can actually, they can measure the outcome if you have it at home. And, um, and I think that's going to uh, be, um, more available to patients so that we would be able to learn directly from the patient without their uh, immediate need to come to the uh, clinic. And telemedicine is improving uh, rapidly. And I think that's going to expedite uh, clinical trials in the future. But right now, you know, we're just hit in the head with COVID like, you know, and we have to mature immediately or we have to mature very fast uh, with research, with clinical trials, with everything. And, uh, but, if we look for the future, I think it's going to be much better. It's, uh, it, yes, it initiated a change, but if we adapt to that change, I think future will be uh, much more effective. That's why I'm a little bit uh, optimistic. And uh, with the um, Niels, they have um, connected the centers uh, in the United States so that when there's one clinical trial, uh, at one center, multiple other centers are also united so that, you know, it's not just one doctor doing one clinical trial, it's a massive effort. And uh, with hundreds of patients um, all in the same trial, and this is a continuous trial. So I think, uh, you know, good things are going to happen. And now it is the, you know, volatile times or the changing times, but the more we adapt to this and the more we, we take leadership, I think it's going to be better for the patients. And I think it's important that they stay safe at home, that they don't have COVID and, you know, just 
just keep their health as is, and we look for the future. Um, I, I, th I thought that your comments about the, the juxtaposition of COVID uh, research and, and so forth, you know, it uh, very appropriately is attracting tons of resources and tons of attention. Uh, so for, for any kind of treatment or um, uh, vaccine even, um, and um, uh, and I think it's a I think it's a good illustration and a good analog uh, for how uh, additional resources uh, can really accelerate some of the some of the work that is being done in ALS or PLS or uh, uh, some of these others. Um, uh, with respect to uh, to resources, somebody asked a question that I'll I'll paraphrase. Uh, but it really has to do with um, uh, making sure that these uh, these very effective patient-led nonprofits that are out there uh, are able to direct their resources to uh, to 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 researchers' work, your your work, and and other other res uh, researchers around the world. Um, I realize that's a little bit of a of a loaded question, but um, uh, but uh, talk to us about how. Um, uh, how, how, how those uh, resources can be directed your way. Yes, so it's not just my way, but I want to say that uh, the reason we wanted to do this webinar was because the world is so uh, fulfilled with COVID news, COVID this, COVID that, and, and I did not like the fact that the ALS patients, ALS patients or HSP, PLS patients felt that they are left behind or that they are forgotten or that, you know, the uh, I, I want them still to be um, the, um, what do you call, they have the attention of the world because uh, this is an important problem as well. And, you know, with COVID, the death rate maybe is 2%, 3%, but with ALS, it's 100%, you know? Yes, it may not be contagious, but once you have it, that you have it. So why don't we make this a major problem as well? Why don't we present this as a major problem as well? And it's up to us. And this is May, ALS Awareness Month. And I thought that would be the best time to begin to speak about this. And I think COVID sets a very good uh, uh, layout because if the world gets together, we will have a uh, solution. So why don't we get together to have a solution for motor neuron diseases, for rare diseases? And I wanted to speak to them because we work very, very hard. You know, you know me, I'm in the lab Saturday, Sunday, Monday. My lab works all the time. And it's not just me. There are hundreds of labs like this working very hard. We did not stop. We, we are still working very hard because as I said, what is the goal? And we focus on that goal and we move forward. And I think patients need to understand that we uh, keep our promise and we, uh, you know, uh, work towards the goal and we focus our attention to the goal. And I think we learn from these uh, COVID times, we apply them and we form our teams and we work together. And I think patient-led um, nonprofits see that and because you know their patients cannot wait, nobody can wait. So I think this is the best time uh, to get together and uh, to form teams and uh, for effective solutions. That's terrific, and and just as a as a way to underscore uh, Hande's uh, work ethic, I uh, 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 the the email that I got last night from her was timestamped two and uh, two at eleven in the morning or something like that. You really should uh, try to get more sleep. I think um, the um, um, uh, just one or two more questions, and then and then we'll wrap up. Um, a um, uh, one one of the of our um, our listeners asked. Uh, do you think that ALS is an aggressive form of PLS? I would love to answer that question. And uh, we would like to know the difference between ALS and PLS. Uh, because in ALS, upper motor neurons die. In PLS, upper motor neurons die. But do they die due to the same uh, causes? And it is possible that the, the reasons for their degeneration may be different. So uh, I don't I don't know if ALS is, a, is a, um, a type of PLS, but I would like to tell you this. I think these diseases are a continuum. Like, you know, it is, it is our definition that we call this ALS, we call this PLS, we call this HSP. So I think that this is like a tree and each branch is a different disease. So there are common mechanisms like mitochondrial dysfunction could be a common pathology and there are very unique um, pathologies that are very specific for them. 
and you know it may cause something else. For example, the Golgi defect that we see in the alcin, we don't see it in the TDP, we don't see it in the profilin. So why only alcin that we see Golgi? And you know there may be some unique uh, aspects of neurodegeneration, and then there are some common ones. And that's why I think I'm a bit against uh, of um, you know defining pathologies just by disease names because then, for example, drug companies say. I'm looking for a, a drug for Alzheimer's. I'm looking for a drug for Parkinson's. I'm looking for a drug for ALS. But if we were to say, um, I'm looking for a drug that improves the uh, integrity of mitochondrial inner membrane, then this mitochondrial inner membrane defects are observed in some Parkinson's patients, are observed in some Alzheimer's patients, are some in PLS patients. So then we don't, um, find a drug for a disease. We find a drug for an underlying cause. And that underlying cause may be shared by many rare diseases. So then we don't even need the definition of a rare disease. So that's why if we focus our attention to the mechanism, then we can actually uh, approach to drug companies and say, look, you're not just going to cure one disease. You're going to cure multiple patients in multiple diseases. Because the drug discovery um, you know, the um, paperwork, the definitions, the politics, and everything was prepared in the 1940s, 60s, 70s with the knowledge that we had at the time. We didn't know the underlying cellar causes. We didn't know the molecular mechanisms. We didn't know any of that. So we thought based on the um, pathologies observed in the patient or based on their behavior, we define them as this disease, that disease. But I think there's more to that. So in some patients, for example, they are first diagnosed with PLS, and then they say, oops, this is not PLS, this is ALS. And, um, you know, in some patients, uh, it is pre predominantly upper motor neuron ALS, but uh, there are also shared mutations between ALS and PLS patients. So there is more to discover, but I'm more favor, uh, in favor of looking into the mechanisms rather than disease names. Well. And we are all for that because I think that, as you point out, um, uh, the um, uh, by solving one problem, there may be advances um, uh, potentially, um, you know, complete uh, uh, advances made on any number of um, any number of diseases. Um, I, I, a number of people have um, uh, have indicated that uh, that we have to. Um, uh, kind of wrap up here, and I, I am so appreciative, uh, Hande, of your time um, and your your candor and input here. This is just amazing to um, uh, to hear. I think everybody uh, who's listening uh, surely can understand um, how it was that uh, that we were first inspired uh, by some of Hande's work, and um, uh, and really have have wanted to support her and her lab uh, ever since then. So. Um, uh, we'll, we'll be following up with everybody by email, uh, both as a thank you and a follow up to see if we can, um, if we can kind of improve this format for our next go round. Um, and, um, uh, and we look forward to having people um, uh, kind of stay on top of our blog on our website, uh, so that we can let people know kind of when the next, um, uh, next um, uh, uh, meeting like this will be held. Um, we're going to try for every couple of months. Um, and, um, uh, and of course, that will put us right into the middle of uh, summer swimming season. So we'll see what, uh, what, we can, uh, what we can produce for that. But again, thank you, um, everybody, for, for patching in. Thank you, Hande, for your wonderful remarks. And, um, uh, and let's, uh, let's keep up this fight because we're going to win it. Yes, we will win. Thank you so much, Doc, for the invitation. And thank you, everyone, for listening. And please, let's form the team and move forward together. Thanks so much, all.